Hello everyone, welcome back to the Peace Love Hormones podcast. Today we are going to be talking about Withania somnifera, commonly known and referred to as ashwagandha. This is a very highly medicinal, valued plant in the family of Solanaceae, and I have seen a lot of misconception and misinformation thrown around about ashwagandha. So as a clinical herbalist, not only do I want to, but I feel like it is my duty to dedicate a short but informational podcast episode all about this beautiful, wonderful, powerful herb that has been around for 6,000 years. Ashwagandha is also referred to as Indian winter cherry and Indian ginseng, although it is not botanically related to true ginseng. So just a little tidbit there so no one gets confused. Ashwagandha has been around for 6,000 years. The earliest mentions that we have of ashwagandha being used medicinally actually comes from Ayurvedic medical literature and textbooks. Ayurveda is the traditional medical system of India and it's very powerful. I refer to many different Ayurvedic practices throughout my own work and research and obviously throughout this podcast. So perhaps you already know about the powers of ashwagandha. If you do, welcome. Thank you for listening to this episode nonetheless. I'm sure you'll still learn something new because there's always things to be learned. Or perhaps you're listening to this episode because you have actually heard some negative, potentially even scary things about ashwagandha. And I must say this and preface this episode with always make sure that any sort of health information you are getting, whether it be on social media or podcast, make sure that it's from someone who's actually qualified and an expert in that area, especially when it comes to herbal medicine and making sure that you're getting your herbal education and herbal information from a qualified herbalist. The only person I would say you could get herbal information from that isn't an herbalist specifically would be from a naturopathic doctor because as a part of their curriculum, Instead of learning about pharmaceutical medications, they're learning about nutraceuticals and um, natural pharmacological interventions such as herbal medicine and functional supplementation. Outside of that, please make sure that you're taking everything that you hear, whether it's herbal medicine related or not, with a grain of potassium and make sure that everything you hear, you always tailor it to your own physiology and keep in mind that just because one diet or one herb or one workout or one specific thing worked really well for someone else does not mean necessarily that it will have the same exact effect on you. And what really sparked this specific episode for myself was a tweet that I saw. For anyone who's not on Twitter, I highly recommend it. I personally have really enjoyed being on what is now called X, and I post almost every single day, Monday through Friday. So definitely go follow me over there if you don't already. But I saw a health influencer who was really big on Instagram and X specifically, talk about ashwagandha. It was a very short tweet and more or less, he sort of bashed the herb a little bit and said that essentially wasn't working for him. He's heard that it hasn't worked for other people and then opened up the conversation, asked anyone else how they have felt on ashwagandha. And while most of the comments were actually really positive, the comments were people saying, I actually disagree. Ashwagandha has been life-changing for me or ashwagandha has been incredible. Um, And then kind of the worst comment I saw was just someone saying that they've been taking ashwagandha for a handful of months and haven't noticed any difference, positive or negative. So I immediately, when I saw this tweet, started questioning about the person, the health influencer specifically who posted it. Was it really the ashwagandha that wasn't working for him? Or was it the specific supplement that he was taking? Was it the quality of the ashwagandha that he was taking? Was it a standardized extract, which most of the time when it comes to herbalism, not all of the time, not 100%, it's not so one end of the extreme or the other, but most of the time I don't really like standardized extracts. I just don't, and we'll get into exactly what those are in a little bit, but um, 
immediately when I saw this tweet and when I've heard any sort of backlash on any herb, I think of number one, was it a standardized extract? Because that could be the issue. Is it the person's diet? Is it a poor diet, which is causing inflammation, which is impacting negatively their hormones and their blood sugar and inflammation and their metabolism? Is it perhaps the lifestyle that they're living? Is it a very unfulfilling, sad, anger-filled lifestyle that this person is living. Does the person need to de detoxify, especially when it comes to ashwagandha? Ashwagandha is a builder herb and a restorative herb, a tonifying herb. We'll get into all the health benefits of, of ashwagandha. But if you need to detoxify and actually need to support detoxification and elimination first before you do anything else, that is very important to prioritize before you start taking any sort of builder and restorative herb. So I kind of just went through this whole list in my head uh, right away. And instead of myself thinking ashwagandha is bad, because I don't think that, I love ashwagandha. I use ashw ashwagandha root in one of my herbal tinctures and I've studied ashwagandha extensively. So I definitely was not uh, considering or reconsidering my thoughts around ashwagandha, but instead was questioning what else is going on in this man's life that is causing him to feel this way. I don't think it's the ashwagandha. If it is the ashwagandha, he needs to look into the quality of that ashwagandha, make sure that the root exclusively is being used, make sure that it's the entire root and that it's not a standardized extract. Needs to make sure again, the quality and the sourcing, not just of that company where they got that ashwagandha from, but he also needs to make sure that he didn't buy this this supplement off of Amazon and it's been sitting on shelves for years and perhaps it's bad and moldy. He needs to check in with a lot of other things before he just goes and bashes ashwagandha. I was a little upset. I was like, what the heck? Um, but I wasn't that upset because I've definitely seen a lot of misinformation and misconception out there when it comes to herbal medicine. And it's understandable. Most people think that just because you read a book or you read one research study or because you take some herbal supplements that that makes you um, a qualified expert in the herbal realm. And it's a little unfair sometimes because people like myself who literally spend so much time, energy, money as well, finances going to school for herbal medicine know that it goes much deeper than um, just taking a supplement or just reading one book or heck reading even 10 books, right? That still doesn't get you to that expert level. So I'm here to, to clear up uh, the what word am I looking for? I was going to say must, but <laughs> I'm here to clean up the must in the dirt. Um, I'm here to clean up the, the misconceptions. Also, last thing I'll say is that you can find a research study for pretty much anything. You could find a research study saying that Oreos are healthier than chicken or Oreos are healthier than red meat. So um, just because you see someone sharing the science air quote on social media, it may look like they are very smart and they do their work and they do their research, but that doesn't necessarily mean and that's the case. So uh, they could also be very smart and it could be really great research, but I'm just saying take everything with a grain of potassium. Also, anything that is natural with minimal side effects is going to be attacked by big pharma. And that's not a conspiracy theory. It is just how it is. It's the nature of big pharma, which is a massive, massive company who spends most of their money, not on research and development, but actually on marketing. And that is just a fact. We can we can see it, we can tra track the numbers. And it's also notable that the approving committees for medications have a lot of conflict of interest. And the FDA approves many medications that have crazy side effects, as most of us know from watching infomercials and or from talking to other people or reading the pamphlets that come in the boxes of medications. Some of the side effects even include death. So pretty wild what FDA approves and many medications that the FDA approves actually get pulled back off the market, uh, whether it's one year later, two, five, 15, 20, et cetera, down the line. So just because something is FDA approved does not mean it's safe either. And uh, I always remind people of that because many people are skeptical of taking something like ashwagandha, which has been around for 6,000 years and has very minimal side effects. Of course, anything could have a side effect. Eating uh, too many 
of a natural, wholesome fruit or vegetable could potentially have negative side effects within the body. So nothing comes 100% risk-free in this life, health-related or not. Just make it make sense, everyone. Please make it make sense for me. Why are people scared of herbalism? <laughs> also a note on standardized extracts. So if someone, particularly a pharmaceutical company or even a nutraceutical company, uses any part of a plant, whether it's the right part of the plant, for example, in this case, the root of ashwagandha, or especially if they're using the wrong part of the plant and then they take that uh, and they concentrate and standardize a specific chemical constituent, such as lactones or alkaloids, for example, then they are standardizing and concentrating that specific chemical constituent. And it could be harmful, especially when taken at higher doses to an organ, tissue, or system of the body. So I am not discrediting that. I fully believe that some herbs and some chemical constituents should be standardized, but other things should not be, which is why I use the whole part of the plant that is medicinal. In my herbal tinctures, we extract all of the nutrients because all of the chemical constituents really work together like a band. So I always make this analogy for people. If you're listening to a band and you're just listening to the singer sing, sounds great, right? Like they can be a great singer, but the music starts to sound better once you add in the bassist and the guitarist and the drummer and the pianist. And once you get everyone in there, it is complete. It sounds complete. Again, not that the singer didn't sound great by herself or himself, but it sounds better as a whole band. I often make this analogy and relate this parallel to herbalism and that one chemical constituent can be particularly beneficial, but usually we like all of the chemical constituents um, that are part of that specific plant and that specific part of the plant to work together to make uh, all of the beautiful, wonderful health effects. So let's get into, now that that rant is over, let's get into some of the benefits of ashwagandha. Just to warn everyone, this is going to be a long list because there are a ton of benefits for this herb. That's the wonderful thing about herbs. Most herbs have well over five to 10 plus benefits. Yeah, this definitely includes well over 10, 10 different benefits of ashwagandha. So let's go down my list. Number one, it's a wildly restorative and regenerative herb on a deep, deep cellular level. This herb and its con chemical constituents get deep and really start the healing from a deep root level. It is hands down one of the best herbs to deal with stress and depression and anxiety. It helps to increase stamina. It reduces inflammation. It's very, very, very antioxidant rich. So it supports our cellular health. Our cellular health is everything. It reduces inflammation. It also helps with aging and helps to make aging more graceful and slow. It also lowers cortisol which can help to regulate estrogen and other hormones and to shrink fibroids as well because we know of the estrogen fibroid connection. I have a podcast episode on that if you're interested in going deeper. And while it is true that acute cortisol and acute inflammation is a healthy physiological response, chronic stress, which creates chronic inflammation on the body, is not so great for us. It negatively impacts our metabolism and our immunity, our inflammation, our blood sugar levels, our hormones, including insulin and estrogen. So we want to make sure that we are not experiencing chronic stress and therefore chronic inflammation. And on the note of insulin, many of us have heard of insulin resistance. Well, there is such thing as cortisol resistance. So we can develop cortisol resistance, meaning we have very high levels of cortisol in our bloodstream and our cells are not utilizing that cortisol. So what is so wonderful, one of the many wonderful things about ashwagandha is it actually makes cortisol more sensitive. So therefore our body doesn't have to overproduce cortisol because our cortisol that we are producing is actually being utilized by the cells. This also supports our nervous system, our immune system, and our digestive system. Ashwagandha also enhances our thyroid function. It enhances our thyroid levels, which is amazing for anyone struggling with thyroid issues, especially for postpartum. Thyroid struggles are very common in postpartum. It's not a given. I'm not saying that to scare anyone because it's definitely not a given. Um, and also many of us uh, suffer with or struggle with subclinical hypothyroid. So 
This can be a wonderful herb for supporting that and can be an ally in those situations. It's also an analgesic herb, meaning it calms and reduces pain. It is a calming adaptogen, which means it supports our nervous system and our stress resiliency, and it has a non-specific response. So it's really going to go into the body, do what it needs to do. It doesn't have uh, this push or pull one or the other type of action on the body. It really just goes in and supports multiple systems at the same time. It's anti arthritic, anxiolytic, meaning it calms anxiety. It has antibacterial activity without harming human red blood cells, like many synthetic antibiotics do. It is anti-asthmatic, meaning it supports a healthy respiratory tract. It's anti-inflammatory. It's aphrodisiac. And if you haven't listened to my two-part series on herbal aphrodisiacs and the feminine libido and arousal, and we also talk about male libido and arousal, I highly recommend going back and listening to that. It's possibly shown to be anti-tumor. I already said powerful antioxidant. Looks like I really wanted to say that because I wrote it down twice. It is a very powerful antioxidant, but I said that earlier when we we talked about how it is anti-inflammatory. It is possibly anti-proliferative. It is anti-spasmodic, meaning it helps to prevent muscle spasms and cramps. It is mildly um, astringent, so it can help with drying and toning of the tissues if needed. And organs, especially reproductive organs. It can help with that if needed. It is cardioprotective, a diuretic, carminative, a calming sedative, immunomodulator, meaning it can increase or decrease our immune response depending on what we need. It is what is known as a febrifuge, meaning it relieves fever by lowering body temperature slightly. A tonic herb. It's a great tonic herb, which is why I just believe most people should be taking it. Again, not everyone, but uh, we'll get into that in a little bit who may reconsider taking this herb, but most of the population should be taking this beautiful tonic herb. It can support sperm count and testosterone levels in men and help to boost overall fertility levels in women. It is a sleep supporter. It helps you to fall asleep and to stay asleep, but many people take ashwagandha during the day. It's not a sedative in that it's going to um, knock you uh, asleep right when you take it, but everyone's different. So if it does have that effect on you, maybe just take it before bed. It also supports focus and cognition. It is very rich in iron, which is really great, especially for my menstruating ladies um, and postpartum ladies as well to support with replenishment. And a little side note, it has been used as a pregnancy tonic in Ayurvedic medicine and as a uterine tonic for repetitive miscarriage in African herbalism. It is noted that not all herbalists agree with using ashwagandha during pregnancy, or perhaps it's not that an herbalist doesn't agree with it, but he or she just hasn't had that training. So if you do want to work with this herb, ashwagandha, and you're pregnant, I highly recommend working one-on-one -on -one with a clinical herbalist to determine the dosage, the frequency, and uh, to just monitor you as well. But chances are your herbal practitioner will probably recommend a different herb um, aside from ashwagandha, many other herbs during pregnancy. Also, it's to be noted that there are some cases reported in Western herbalism of ashwagandha being used as an abortification herb. So Definitely nuances to this herb. Um, we don't know too much about what part of the plant was used for that purpose or if uh, like the dosage, the frequency, we have no idea. So please do not uh, take this information and go use it for that purpose. This is just to give everyone a really well-rounded knowledge and foundational base of this powerful herb. Lots of nuance and controversy between using it for pregnancy and etc. Supports blood sugar regulation. It also supports mood, including depression and PMS and anxiety. It has a, a profound effect on women going through perimenopause and can reduce hot flashes. It has a normalizing effect on estrogen. It supports our bone and our heart health. And I mentioned this before, but it does support healthy aging thanks to being so antioxidant rich and its ability to modulate inflammation. So a few studies that I really love, uh, there are so many studies on ashwagandha. Again, some are not done very well, but some are done really well. So I want to go over a few studies related to ashwagandha. So a study, there was a study done with a group of 50 people who are subclinical hypothyroid. I want to start off with this one because I think there's a lot of talk around ashwagandha and the thyroid. So 
Let's start off with this one. So within eight weeks, they saw significant improvements in TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, T4 and T3 levels. This showed and proved that ashwagandha can be a, a wonderful herbal ally for hypothyroidism. In another study, researchers found that certain parts of ashwagandha uh, have a compound called withanoside 4 and its cousin saminone. 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 I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> that one. <laughs> saminone. Sometimes I just like to sing things uh, to myself. Um, but anyway, these wonderful compounds can help to improve memory and protect the brain connections in conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Also, another chemical constituent, because plants have many, many, like hundreds, sometimes even thousands of chemical constituents. So, Another chemical constituent in ashwagandha might help nerve cells grow better, which could protect the brain too. So neuroprotective, amazing. We love that. In a, a, another 60-day trial, serum cortisol levels significantly lowered in the ashwagandha group. The entire group said that they experienced a 41% reduction in anxiety. Powerful. And then a systematic review and meta-analysis on 400 people that showed improved sleep quality and reduced insomnia after taking ashwagandha for eight weeks. Usually when I'm working with the herb, I like to work with it for at least 12 weeks, so about three months. And also this group in the study showed improved mental alertness upon waking, which just goes to show how restorative ashwagandha is. You're not going to feel groggy or fatigue when you wake up in the morning after taking ashwagandha, which is great because a lot of other sleep aids, whether they're synthetic, especially the synthetic ones, but even the natural ones sometimes can leave people feeling a little bit off and fatigued the next morning. Next, let's talk about perimenopausal women. So in a study of a group of 100 perimenopausal women who took ashwagandha for eight weeks, we saw significant decreases in hot flashes and improvements in mood and urinary health and vaginal dryness. There was also a significant increase in estradiol, which is an explanation for the increase in vaginal urinary health and dryness as estradiol helps with the juiciness and lubrication of the tissues of the vaginal and pelvic cavity. And then there was another study that I really loved um, and I actually talked about this study a little bit in the arousal and herbal aphrodisiac podcast episodes, but it just showed that the group that was taking ashwagandha saw a significant increase in arousal, lubrication, pleasure, and orgasm. So how amazing is that? Now let's get into some safety. Ashwagandha overall is a very considered a very safe and low risk herb, but there are always nuances and bioindividuality always. So let's get into some of them. So as always, before you take any new herb or supplement, if you are on any medication, please do make sure that whatever you're about to start works well with the medication that you're taking. I always recommend that you go ask your physician, healthcare provider who prescribed that medication, uh, just because they are the expert on that specific medication, or I hope they are. And if they're not, then you should go find a different physician if that uh, is a medication that you really need and make sure that they can really educate you on what to do and what not to do while taking that medication. And with ashwagandha and with most herbs, unless we're working with herbs because we are sick with a virus or some sort of infection, I like to work with ashwagandha and most herbs in smaller doses over longer periods of time with little breaks in between. So usually because I am a menstruating woman and I have my cycle every single month, I usually take a break on various supplements and remedies that I'm taking when I'm on my period. I just use that as a nice little reminder so I don't have to like write it down in my calendar somewhere. Uh, take a break from this supplement or take a break from this herb. I usually just take a few days off because my period lasts about three days. So I usually just stop and take a little break from whatever I'm doing if needed, if that break is needed while I'm on my period. And again, ashwagandha is considered to be very safe. It has been used for 6,000 years. It's been used by so many different human bodies and prescribed by so many different practitioners. It's really, really stood the test of time. But let's talk about the thyroid really quickly because there are a couple of case reports of people experiencing hyperthyroid after taking ashwagandha. These are case reports, not case studies, meaning that one person or a small group of people came in and reported this uh, to their physician that, that they felt this way and they hopefully also 
ran labs to confirm that. It's not common, but it's definitely something to be aware of, especially if you are on thyroid medication. Again, make sure that this is the right herb for you if you're on thyroid medication. And if you struggle already with hyperthyroid, make sure to consider the potential of it maybe worsening hyperthyroid. And nothing that I'm saying in this podcast episode, because the nature of this, this information and education is in a podcast episode. None of this is medical advice. So I'm not telling you to take ashwagandha if you're on thyroid medication. I'm not telling you to start thyroid medication, just like I'm not telling someone to stop their thyroid medication. So again, please work with whatever, whomever prescribed you that medication, because they're going to be the expert in that. And then work with an herbal practitioner or do your own research if you feel comfortable and confident in doing that outside of this episode to see if ashwagandha works right for you. But again, if you're not struggling with hyperthyroid um, and you're not on thyroid medications, then you can kind of just ignore what I just said. Also consider if you have a nightshade sensitivity, it does come from the Solanaceae family, which is also known as the nightshade family. This is very rare that people would experience any sort of sensitivity or reaction to that because of it, but just beware. I want to give you all the information. Also be cautious if you have hemochromatosis, which means you have excess iron in your body. Again, this is rare. We usually see it more so for men and menopausal women because they're not menstruating anymore. If you so usually it's the opposite. Women are struggling to get their iron levels up. Also, I mentioned this before, if someone has a lot of congestion, I highly recommend to work on detoxifying and elimination before taking such a powerful building and tonifying and restorative herb such as ashwagandha and many other herbs fall under that category. Uh, pregnancy, again, if you're pregnant, I would advise to not take ashwagandha. If you do want to take ashwagandha, make sure that you are working with an herbal practitioner, a clinical herbalist who has success in pregnant women taking ashwagandha. Um, and then always get good products, always make sure that number one, the product is the ashwagandha root, preferably not standardized as well. Make sure it's organic quality sourcing, no extra sketchy ingredients in the capsule or the tincture or whatever um, tea, whatever form you're taking it in. And always notice if you are feeling off and do a full assessment on all of the herbal remedies and the supplements and the foods that you're eating, anything else going on in your life, were you just sick, are you currently sick, etc. So always do a full assessment of everything and we're all different. So if it doesn't work for you, it's totally okay you can always find another herb as well. So thank you for tuning in. I will include links to uh, number one, my herbal tinctures because I have sleepy, which includes ashwagandha. If you want to start working with this wonderful herb, you can use the code in all caps. We love sleep. I know it's a little bit lengthy, but you can use that code if you want to save on your first order of sleepy. And it contains other herbs in there that support with sleep and nervous system and just total body health and wellness and well-being. I will also include a link to the show notes of this episode so you can read the show notes for this episode. I will also link up the research that I referred to, and I will also include a delicious recipe if you want to work with dried ashwagandha root powder in some fun energy ball um, recipe that I call them my fertility sexy energy balls. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in and until next time, peace, love, hormones. Hormones.